Well, good morning, and thank you very much for having us back to tell our story. Um, as I uh, started to prepare for this presentation, the first thing I did was take a look at the previous presentations we've given at OIS, just to remind myself of how far we've come. Now, this is the title slide from the presentation we gave in 2014. One of the things you'll see is the overall objective of our company goal hasn't changed in that period of time, but a lot of other things certainly have. This was our priorities. In 2014, we're all about raising money. We had one product that was trying to get into phase three. It's more pressing, one product that was leaving phase two. We had about 30 employees in the company. You spin that ahead to today, we have just shy of 400 employees in our company. We're doing studies in 13 different countries on four different products. And of course, we have two products that are approved and we're commercializing them in the US. Our parties now are expanding past glaucoma to another disease state in the geographies in which we compete from a commercial standpoint. And the four building blocks to that are listed on the slide, and I'll walk you through those. Now, <clears throat> first step was entering the US glaucoma market with our two glaucoma products that both can claim first-of-kind status. A Repressa is a real kinase inhibitor. It represents the first new class of drug to enter the glaucoma market in more than 20 years. Now, we launched Repressa in May of last year, so it was on the market for eight months, and in those eight months, we generated just north of $24 million in net sales. Roclitan is our fixed-dose combination product that contains Natarsidil, the active ingredient in Repressa and Latanoprost, and we're launching Repressa, I'm sorry, Roclitan this week. Now, I'm commonly asked, well, how does the launch of Repressa compare to the other more common or most recent uh, glaucoma product losses, and this slide answers that. As you can see, in the eight months of last year, Repressa generated about 109,000 prescriptions. That's three times the amount generated by product number one, and 50% higher than the product in red in its first eight months. On the right-hand side of the scale, we don't have just prescription data for that. We have another IMS measurement called dollarized prescriptions, and as you can see, Repressa generated 50% more dollarized prescriptions than that product did as well. So the answer is we've done quite well. We're quite happy with that. Now, Roclitan brings a whole new set of firsts into the marketplace. Not only is it the first new or the first time a, a, a combination has had a process advantage in the United States, it's also the first combination anywhere in the world that contains a rho kinase inhibitor. Also, it's the first time a product has ever demonstrated statistically superior IOP lowering in U.S. phase three trials compared to the world's top selling eye drop, which of course is Latanoprost. So we're quite excited about that. Now here's a data slide that shows you the responder analysis from our two U.S. phase three trials. It shows the proportion of patients in each arm with, with Roclitan being in the green that achieved certain levels of IOP lowering. So you can see that a statistically superior percentage of patients in the Roclitan arm achieved each level of IOP lowering as compared to the individual components. Additionally, you can see that two or th two times uh, the percentage of Roclitan patients were able to achieve a 30 to 35 percent reduction for baseline as compared to Latanoprost, and three times the amount of Roclitan patients were able to achieve a 40 percent reduction in IOP compared to, again, Latanoprost. We're quite happy with that. From an AE perspective, first good news was there were no new AEs found in the Roclitan arm that already, weren't already identified in the uh, Ropressa or Latanoprost arms. Most common AE was ocular hyperemia. And again, as we saw with Repressa, the vast majority of the time, that is 80 to 90% of the cases, it was very mild in nature and it was highly sporadic. In fact, only 20% of the patients actually had hyperemia at each study visit. For the rest of them, it came and then it went away. Now, the second building block calls for geographic expansion of our glaucoma franchise into both Europe and Japan. We're quite happy with our progress here. First, in Europe, from a, from a regulatory perspective, we anticipate action from the EMA on our Rokinza, which is the name for Ropressa in Europe, towards the end of this year. Now, assuming approval of Rokinza, we'll turn around and file our file for Roclitan in Europe as well. If you go down a couple of points here, you can see we've hired a chief commercial officer who's here in the audience today to begin working on his pre-launch as well as his launch strategies and plans. And our plant in Ireland, our manufacturing facility, we're highly confident that this continues to progress very nicely and we'll be producing units by the, end of, or, uh, by the middle of next year. Now in Japan, we're also making very good inroads. We have four employees now in Japan and in our office in Tokyo. We did our pilot studies in the US using Japanese and Japanese American uh, uh, subjects. And this year, we started our phase 2B trial in Japan. Completion of that will allow us to uh, begin enrollment into phase 3, which will, of course, occur next year. Now, 
Our fourth final step in this presentation involves uh, leaving the glaucoma market and entering the, uh, the retina market. Here we have two product candidates, 1105 and 13503. Now we've dosed the first patients with 1105 last quarter, 13503 will dose our first patients this quarter. So, 1105 is a dexamethasone steroid implant. Now we're targeting six months of uh, therapy, th six months worth of treatment off of one implant. The retina specialists tell us this is the sweet spot for them, and we plan on uh, releasing top line results of our study uh, in next year. Now 13503 has a lot of excitement with the retina specialist because it brings new MOAs into the treatment for both uh, AMD as well as uh, DME. 13503, as you can see, is an inhibitor of both rho kinase as well as protein kinase C. Again, we're targeting six months worth of therapy for, uh, for the one implant. And uh, we hope to release top line results uh, later this year on our first of our trials. Now, our retina program is also bolstered by a relationship as well as the technology in the right-hand side. The relationship is with a company called DSM, which is a broad-based chemical company in the Netherlands who has particular expertise in making bilirotable sustained release implants that can hit our targeted drug elution rates to give us that length of, th of efficacy that I've mentioned a couple of times. Of course, the print technology is where we take the uh, bilirotable implants, the DSM engineers, and then we can manufacture those. And this is done in, an, in our facility, in an RTP, in a, in a GMP facility. So quite happy with the, uh, with the assets that we have, not just product-wise, in our, in our uh, retina program. Now, I'll just end with two data slides. The first data slide shows um, 13503 versus ILEA. This is the oxygen-induced retinopathy model in the mouse. And as you can see by looking at the two bars there, the uh, effectiveness of ILEA and 503 was, in fact, equal. They were equivalent to each other. So this is a highly encouraging, obviously very early stage, but highly encouraging results that get, again, the retina specialists excited. But the second slide also gets them very, very excited because this is using the same model again. The two middle bars are monotherapy for both ILEA as well as 13503, but the bar that we really want to pay attention to is the one on the far right that shows when ILEA and 13503 are used as adjuncts or they're used concomitantly to treat the disease. And as you can see, the results were far better. The reason it gets them so, so excited, if you don't know, is that uh, they don't have an adjunct that they can use with anti-VEGF therapy today. And the problem with anti-VEGF therapy, though highly effective, early on in treatment, years later, starts their effectiveness starts to erode. So if they had an adjunctive therapy like 13503 to add to that to increase the effectiveness, they would be uh, all hands on deck, as they like to say. So we're very uh, thankful for, again, the time today to, uh, to uh, tell you our story, and we look forward to keeping you updated.